So I've been doing research on attention and perception for a number of years. My first job was at the U.S. Army Aeroflight Dynamics Director at Crew Station Research and Development Facility, NASA Ames, Moffett Field, California, trying to understand why perfectly good Army pilots would get sick in our simulator and ruin it for us. I've been really interested for a long time trying to understand how it is that we can move around the world and do all the amazing things that we do. And what I've discovered in the research that we've been doing looking at distracted driving is one basic thing that I should have known from when I was an undergraduate that psychology has been telling us for a really long time. The best ability that our brain has is the ability to deceive ourselves. And we see this in lots of different ways. You just saw it in a demonstration that Joel gave you. You were deceived into thinking you could see this very complex scene and count how many things were going on. Your eyes were open. You had this wonderful panorama, full color, uh, no stereo, but you, you, know, you normally do. And you thought you could see everything, but you couldn't. And one of the things that cognitive science has taught us over the last few years is that this happens every single day. In fact, the amount of information we can process is extremely limited. If I'm a scientist and I walk up to you on the street and I run a little experiment where I have you give directions, which is tough on the brain, and I switch someone out, so now you're talking to a new person. <laughs> this is Dan Simons again, 70% of the time. Over two-thirds of the time, you don't notice you're talking to a completely different person. <laughs> There'll be more demos like this to try to understand how it is our brain deceives us into thinking we can really see the world around us in high fidelity when in fact we can't. But there are other ways that we deceive ourselves, too. Many of you have children, and you put them out on the roads. You may or you may not realize that if you're under 25, the most dangerous thing you can do is be in a vehicle. In fact, it leads to more fatalities than the next three things combined. And yet we deceive ourselves into thinking that it's perfectly safe. I mean, if we woke up this morning and turned on USA Today and we saw this headline online, teen crashes, claim lives, eight dead, 960 taken to the emergency room, it would certainly catch our attention, but we would probably say, well, that's other people. If we woke up the next morning and we saw the same headline, we might start wondering what's going on. If we got up the next morning and we had the, next, the same headline, and so on and so forth, every single day of the year which would equate to the number of people that are actually lost on our roadways in the United States every year in that age group. You now would be faced with a problem because you thought that you were putting your son or daughter in a vehicle and it was safe. But now evidence is telling you otherwise. And yet we deceive ourselves. We allow ourselves to think that driving is a generally safe activity, despite the fact that everyone in this room in some way, shape, or form has an interest in traffic safety. This idea, the idea that the real weak link in traffic safety is the human, really came home to me this summer. I went to visit my in-laws in Vietnam, where I saw some amazing traffic safety demonstrations. <laughs> Putting four people on a scooter and driving for three hours on a freeway is not uncommon. This is not an unusual picture. The Vietnam roadways are less good than ours in terms of their asphalts and their designs. Enforcement is lower. First response is ridiculously pitiful. Um, and obviously people engage in a large number of what we would deem to be uh, deadly behaviors. And if you look at their fatality statistics, you say to yourself, well, yeah, they're four times as bad as the rest of the world. That makes sense to me. And yet, when you look at the fatality statistics in the United States, you have to be faced with a problem. That is, we're no better than drivers in Vietnam, even though we have safer roads, airbags, heavy enforcement, and a number of other things that should make us safer. The problem is, our drivers are less safe. We are not safer because of our vehicles. We're not safer because of our roads, though these things are contributing. We have essentially reduced those safety benefits because we're doing things that are unsafe. The thing we're talking about today is distracted driving. And this is a big one. I'm not going to try to convince you that distracted driving is a problem. If you don't believe that by now, nothing I can say or do will convince you of that. And I'll give you some demonstrations to maybe convince you you're fooling yourself. But the data that are out there are not controversial. We have data from looking at people's phone records after they've been in a crash. We have data from people driving and driving simulators. We have data from behavioral studies. We have data from neurophysiological studies. Cognitive science has known for many decades now that this is a problem. It's not a controversial point unless you have a fiduciary interest in making it a controversial point. 
at the high end, there's probably a little over a quarter of our crashes due to this problem. It may be a little bit less than that. Even if it's a little bit less than that, it's still a huge issue. And what we really need to come to grips with, I think, is the fact that this is not an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. It's being supported by a few different factors that I think we need to understand to come to grips with. The first is the fact that these technologies are obviously not going away. They're becoming more ubiquitous every day. These technologies are being adopted earlier and earlier every year. And the use of these things is heavier. The ubiquity is clear. The fact that I was the only person in the room able to raise his hand saying that I don't have a cell phone. Our family does have one. My wife has it because she's driving from Kansas to Texas right now, so she needs it while she's driving, so I don't have it. The fact I was the only person in the room speaks to ubiquity. There's been lots of studies that have been done over the last few years by Pew and others showing that average age of adoption is decreasing every year. Um, you might be shocked by this. I was a little bit shocked. The average age of adoption for cell phones now is eight years old. And speaking with uh, Todd Clement the other night, who abuses his son, who's 11 years old, by not allowing them to have a cell phone, it's pretty clear that kids think, I should, be, I should have a cell phone. Yes, I'm, I'm old enough to punch buttons. Please give me this device. So we're dealing with a generation that will grow up with these things, that has grown up with these things. We're dealing with a generation that, as every year goes by, uses these devices more and more heavily and in more and more invasive ways. Uh, for example, the latest Pew data, and these data are already old by the time they're published, shows that uh, most of the... the Communication now is via text. The thing that shocked me in here was not the fact they don't use email. That's for us dinosaurs. The thing that shocks me is that face-to-face -face interactions now occur at about half the rate of texting interactions. Kids aren't even talking to each other face-to-face -face anymore. They're talking via text. So imagine in the future as you as public safety professionals are trying to tell this generation to stop. Stop doing this. Stop doing this pro-social behavior that we know when you stop doing it will lead to declines in self-esteem, will lead to declines in feelings of belongingness, will make you feel bad. Please stop doing it while you're driving. We're dealing with a generation coming up, the one we're with now and the one that's on their heels, that will not hear this message. Because they fooled themselves into thinking that they have to do this, that it's critical. It, it, this is actually uh, three years old now, but I think, uh, and I like to pick on UCLA because I didn't go there and I'm a Northern Californian. Um, you know, this is a, a young student from UCLA and I think he sums it up in his reaction to distracted driving along California. Uh, not, all, not that I'm, I'm bothered now that not only do I need to interrupt my cell phone call when I see an officer, but I also need to make sure it doesn't look like I'm punching the buttons. The temerity of California to put these laws in place. It's a good school, so I assume he knows what temerity means. Uh, so, you know, this is the attitude, I think, in the generation that we're facing now. This is what I think we really need to come to grips with. The fact that the, those of us in, our room, in the room who look at this problem and say to ourselves, how can this possibly be? Yeah, I know I really like to text and it's really enjoyable for me, but I, you know, I know I, I could actually do what Ray LaHood suggests, which is put it in the glove compartment. I actually tell kids, put it in the trunk. Um, I can do that. I don't think that that message is going to get across. It's going to be difficult. So let me turn back to this central question. And I want to give you some examples from a variety of data we've collected. Because like I said, one of the things I've been amazed at in the research that we've been doing looking at the cognitive side of things is the fact that people continue to do these behaviors despite the fact that they will tell us that these are things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, and one of the messages I want you to take away, if you don't remember anything else from this talk today, what I want you to remember is this as safety professionals. The people that you're talking to already know that this is bad. They know it's dangerous. They know they shouldn't be doing it. In fact, I'll show you data showing that they think it's worse than drunk driving. I'm talking about talking on a phone or texting. That message is clear. They get that. But if that's your only message, you're not going to have an impact because they already understand that and yet they're engaging in the behavior because we can deceive ourselves. Why do we keep doing this despite the fact that we do this? Well, the first problem, and this is what Joel's talked about uh, already, and I think it's an important point to emphasize again, is our brain fools us into thinking we have more capacity than we actually do. And this is one of the great things about cognitive sciences is we can, we can show demonstrations for this, and I'll show a couple in a second. But you know, if, if you're going to take away something in pictorial format, here, here's what I would point out. We have, uh, we have the most computationally complex thing, in, as, as far as we know, in the universe, sitting on the top of our neck. 
We've got something with literally billions of neurons and trillions of connections and multiple areas dedicated to processing specific kinds of information. When you talk about something like speaking, like I'm doing now, or listening, this is something we literally can't get our best supercomputers to do. We can't get our best supercomputers to listen to us and talk back to us and make sense. Nothing's passed the Turing test yet. It's very difficult stuff to do what we're doing right now. This is what we think we have, but this is really what we have. <laughs> we think we've got this complex computer, but we really don't. We don't have a complex computer. Really, for those of you that are old enough, what we have is a 286 with a programmer that was really strategic in the way that they programmed it, right? They, they, they didn't have a, you know, whatever we've got now, quad core, Pentium processor. They said, I'll just, I'm Microsoft, I'll just take all the code I've had written in the last 10 years and I'll add some more code. It'll run, don't worry about it. We've got an organism, or we've got an organ that has to be very strategic in the ways that it processes information. Let alone fun fact. Uh, you have all these signals hitting your retina right now. We call this, in part, the visual, visual processing, vision. 60% of those signals that are hitting your retina will never make it to your occipital cortex for further processing. Over half the signals that fall on your eye are completely lost in what we call the lateral geniculate nucleus. They're gone. They never exist as far as your brain's concerned. We lose so much information and yet we're not aware of it. We think when we're driving down the road that we have this wonderful 180 degree full color 3D panorama. We can see the pedestrian about to walk into the roadway. We can see the SUV as it's about to enter the, the, the roadway to, from the left. We can notice the car in front of us braking or changing speed. This is what we think we see because we have what's called in cognitive science the grand illusion, the brain filling a lot of things in for us. But in fact, we have a relatively small window of information that we're processing at any one moment in time. If you want to know how big it is, it's really simple. Everyone hold your arm out, at, at, a fist out at arm's length. See the size of that fist? See that window? The window is the size of your fist. And you move that window around the world in saccades, you take a bunch of little samples and your brain stitches them together to help you see the world. Where that window isn't, you're not paying attention. You're literally not seeing the world. Let me give you an example. I want to give you an example from some of our driving research. Uh, for those of you that are from Chicago, you might actually recognize this roadway. We're interested in trying to understand what drivers are paying attention to when they're driving down the road. So we presented drivers with scenes of traffic to try to understand what people are paying attention to. And so I'm going to show you a, a, a traffic scene from Chicago. I just want you to raise your hand when you notice the change in the traffic scene. Okay? So we'll start this little video. I'll let it run for a while. We've got a couple of minutes. So, oops, let's go back. There we go. All right. Okay. So just raise your hand when you notice the change. We've got one person. Fantastic. Uh, two people. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, ten. This is about the point where people start saying, I don't think there's any change in this at all. Okay, how many people have looked at that speed limit sign that's there on the left? You looked at that speed limit sign, right? What about that 20-story apartment building right next to the speed limit sign that's appearing and disappearing? Do you notice it now? Now you're saying to yourself, uh, because the brain is designed to protect itself, it's designed to fool itself, you're saying to yourself, well, that's not fair. You told me that I was looking at a traffic scene, and you got me thinking about traffic. And who really cares about a 20-story apartment building appearing or disappearing while I'm driving? That's not important. That doesn't tell me anything. Aha, but it does. What it tells me is that when we attend to the world, it's affected by the goals that we have. Your goal was to think about traffic, and so what you did was you thought about traffic. The first thing you did is probably fixated the car that was right in front of you. And we know that when you fixate that car and you put that little window on that car right in front of you, you see it. You literally see it. It's clear. It makes sense. You attend to it. But we also know that everything that's outside that region is a big fuzzy mess. In fact, George McConkie at the University of Illinois had this great demonstration. He had put people in an eye tracker. He would track their eyes. He could tell where the eye was going to land. Wherever they looked, it was clear like that car is now. Wherever they weren't looking, looked fuzzy like the rest of that image. You would never notice it. I did it once, and I said, well, when are you going to run the study? He's like, oh, in the last five minutes, you've been looking at these images, and you never noticed it. Outside that region, you don't notice it. And so what we do is we strategically move this region... Oops, sorry. 
go back. What we do is we strategically move this region around and say, well, nothing happening at that car. I wonder if there's something happening at this car next to me. And as we move the region of, of attention, the world becomes clear. We then move it to other things that are related to the traffic scene. We'll pay attention to the sign. Oh, that's a pretty big sign. The region's small. I'm going to have to scan it twice. Eventually, you might move this region over to this, this sign, this 50 mile an hour sign, see if anything's happening there. Even though that change, that massive change, this 20 story apartment building appearing and disappearing occurred right next to where you were looking, you didn't notice it. Because it's not about having your eyes open, it's about having your brain attending to information. You didn't attend to the information of the building. When I pointed it out to you, you noticed it. And every time I show this demo now, you will notice that building appearing and disappearing every single time because your attention will go there. But unless your attention is someplace, you will not be able to see the world. In fact, if we put people, this is from Canada, if we put people in a car that has cameras and we ask them to drive down the road and we use a little algorithm to look at where their eyes are looking, when they're driving normally, their eyes normally look within the regions of this box. They're scanning to the left, they're scanning to the right, and if you look at the height of that image, they're actually scanning down the roadway to see what's going on. If we then say, well, here, put this Bluetooth headset in your ear and have a conversation with someone outside the vehicle, this is where their eyes go. They don't look left and right. They look about the distance of their front bumper. And so when, unfortunately, we have someone who tail ends a semi-trailer because they're texting, it's because they weren't actually seeing what was right in front of them. They weren't looking at it, or even if they were looking at it, their brain wasn't necessarily picking that information up. So we get fooled into thinking that we've got a lot more capacity than we actually do. Here's the scary part for me as a cognitive scientist. And I said, became more into social psychology, which in and of itself isn't scary unless you're into what's called terror management theory. Time for another talk. But the big thing here for me that I really worry about as a traffic safety person is that attitudes are disconnected from actions. And this is something we've known in psychology for a really long time, but it's really difficult to get our minds around this when it comes to traffic safety. The first problem that I run into, uh, going back to our student here, when we conduct studies asking, well, how many of you text? We ask college students, how many of you text and drive? If you just ask them that question, about two-thirds will say they text and drive. But you know what? That's the wrong question. How many of you initiate a text message? That's about two-thirds. How many of you read a text message? Well, now we're talking about 90%. How many of you do these behaviors, but you do them when you're sitting at a stoplight or a stop sign? Now we can get about 97% of our younger adults saying that they text and drive just by asking the right kinds of questions. One of the problems is this has become the new norm. The new norm is that people do this behavior constantly. I'm not going to explain all these fancy charts other than tell you we can use lots of fancy statistical techniques to get people's responses and ask them why they do these behaviors. And what we've discovered over and over again, which really isn't new in the health literature, is that they know that these behaviors are dangerous, but knowing the behaviors are dangerous does not reduce how frequently they engage in the behaviors. We ask them, is this a dangerous behavior? Yes. Scale of 1 to 7, how dangerous is it to text and drive? About a 7. Um, do you text and drive? Yes. Uh, so you're telling me that it's very dangerous. Is it worse than driving drunk? Yes. Do you believe people should drive drunk? No. Uh, do you drive drunk? No. Do you text and drive? Yes. Over and over again, we run into the same kind of thing. There's a disconnect between what people believe to be true and what they actually do. And it's even worse than that. Because our brain's ability for self-deception not only leads us to do things we know are unsafe, but when we do something that we know is unsafe, we then change our attitudes. And this is what's called cognitive dissonance. I experienced cognitive dissonance most strongly for the first time, which for some reason I jumped out of a perfectly good military aircraft before it in Georgia. There was no real reason for me to let gravity take hold of my body, except for the fact that I'd signed up for airborne school. After I had jumped out of this perfectly good aircraft, rather than saying to myself, you're a damn fool, why'd you jump out of that airplane? I instead said to myself, this was a very important thing to do. I should have been doing this. It was great training. Because my attitude about safety was disconnected from what I actually did, my actions, I had a choice. Either I could say, I'm a dumb person, or I could say, there was a good reason for doing this. And what we find when people have a disconnect between their actions and their, their beliefs, 
You tell someone texting and driving is unsafe, they say yes, it's unsafe, they go out and text and drive, they will now change their attitudes about how safe it is to drive while texting. We found this out in a study when we were looking at people's driving behaviors and we asked them to think about driving and texting. And we asked them to think about three different conditions. Think about driving and texting when you actually read a text or when someone sends you a text and you reply. So you didn't make a choice to text, but someone sort of forced you into this social contract so you sent a text back, so you've got an excuse. Or you chose on your own to initiate a text. What we found when people are reading text messages, they equate driving on a freeway to driving on in rough weather, you know, when there's hailstorms and, and lots of crazy things going on, on the roadway. When they then thought about actually sending a text message that someone that they're replying to, now they equated driving on the highway to both intense weather conditions and driving on a calm city street in a regular neighborhood. They said to themselves, well, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but someone sort of made me do it, so, you know, maybe, maybe it's not really that bad to do this, but I probably shouldn't. But here's the kicker. When they actually did this on their own, when they chose to reach into their backpack, pick out the, the text message device and send a text, so they've said, I'm choosing to do this thing that I know is bad. Their brain now says, well, driving on the freeway is kind of like driving on calm city streets in a quiet neighborhood. It's not that bad. I can do this. Our capacity for self-deception is incredible. And it's something that we really need to come to grips with as traffic safety professionals. Because just saying over and over again, this is bad, this is dangerous, will not be enough to change. Now, I've discovered in doing this, I, 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 all this is kind of a bummer. Because... You know, I'm telling people that, that their brains are, are fooling them, that, um, that they're these insurmountable problems, and they're really not insurmountable. So I want to leave you with a positive and a small cautionary tale. Um, we conducted a study recently that's coming out this year in which we wanted to understand attitudes about texting, talking on a cell phone while driving, and drunk driving. Um, back in the 70s, and I was really happy to hear uh, the secretary talk about drunk driving attitudes back in the day, um, because it's really hard for students to understand that back in the day, you would just get pulled over and a, a police officer would help you get home if you're driving drunk. Because now they don't understand that. They think drunk driving is this horrible crime. That's a good thing because it shows that attitudes have shifted. So what we did is we replicated the study that was done in the 70s where they looked at drunk driving and they found a similar attitude. Most people thought that drunk driving really wasn't all that bad. And so we gave people these scenarios where we said there was a, someone at a party and we gave one group a scenario. We said Dave was at a party and as he left, uh, he, he had a bunch to drink, he left and the party and then he got in his car. Or Dave was at a party, he left and as he was leaving, he picked up his cell phone and started to send a text message to his significant other. We also had cell phones in there, but I'm not going to show those data today. And then we described a crash in some detail. It was an injury crash. It was very serious. And we asked them three questions. We asked them, one, how, how preventable was this crash? How was responsible was the person for the crash as a function of the different types of antecedents to the crash? Each group had a different antecedent. Drunk driving, talking on a cell phone, texting, or paying attention. We also asked, what kind of fines and punishments should be levied against the driver? Good news and bad news. Here's the good news, and there's two pieces of good news in this I want you to take away today. The first piece of good news is attitudes about drunk driving have changed. The programs that we've engaged in, the enforcement that we've engaged in, have actually changed attitudes in younger drivers about drunk driving. Compared to the uh, attentive driver in yellow or in green on your screen, uh, the, the drunk driver was deemed to be more responsible for the crash, which is good. So those messages have gotten, gotten across and they've worked. Here's the other really good piece of news, I think, and that is that they rate the driver who is texting as the most responsible for the crash. The texting driver created the most preventable crash. When I saw these data, I was really happy. Our younger adults who do it at an alarmingly high rate were saying to me, well, this is really bad and if you get in a crash, you're really at fault. So I was happy with this. So this is good news, two pieces of good news. They're getting the message about distracted driving and they have gotten the message about drunk driving. Two really good pieces of news. Here's the bad news. The bad news is these attitudes don't match up with behaviors. When we ask people to actually levy fines against drunk drivers versus texting drivers, even when we tell them there's a law in place that mandates that you assign the same fines and punishments to a distracted driver as someone, talk, as someone who is drunk, we find that they punish the 
texting drivers significantly less, even though they've told us they're more responsible. They assign fewer, less in terms of fines, and they assign less in terms of jail time. So again, here's the brain fooling itself. Yes, I do this thing. I shouldn't be doing it. If I get in a crash while this happens, I'm really responsible. But please don't punish the people that actually cause these wrecks. We've got a long way to go in traffic safety and dealing with this issue. And in order to overcome it, we're going to have to come to deal with these basic facts. The basic fact is that our brain deceives itself. It's built to deceive itself because, frankly, the world's an uncomfortable place to live in oftentimes, and we have to have these mechanisms. Trust me, without them, we all become wildly depressed. It's not a good thing. Um, the weak link in driver safety is really us. We shouldn't be looking at our roads and our vehicles. People like uh, Texas Department of Transportation do amazing work dealing with uh, road safety, and all of our dots do great jobs with those kinds of things. Um, but we're facing a generation now and a generation coming up that is used to using these devices that, that is even more self-deceptive than the generations before because they've been using them so often they think that they can't. And they're going to overestimate their capacity to a greater degree than those of us in this room today do now. The big thing we have to overcome is, is the problem with traffic safety is we want to always push this, the message, this is dangerous, don't do it. But there's a disconnect between knowing something's bad and actually changing a behavior. And if we're going to actually make changes, we have to come up with some other strategies. But there are ways forward. Strategies to alleviate drunk driving have proven effective. Enforcement campaigns work. And the secret from psychology is it's easier to change a behavior than it is to change an attitude. And guess what? When you change the behavior, attitude comes along with it. So thank you for your attention. I think we have time for a couple of questions. I appreciate your attention today. Thank you.